Chapter 8, Gift for the Darkness. Um, this is a huge monumental shift of a, of a chapter. Um, we see in this particular chapter the, the fragile bond and relationship that Jack and Ralph had. We see that fractured and probably, uh, <coughs> probably not going to be fixed. Um, you see those two alpha males uh, who have been barely able to coexist for a while. It's not happening anymore. And, um, and it, it was kind of a very emotional moment for Jack. I mean, you get to see him again in the, in the state of being just a kid. Uh, you know, starts crying and being very embarrassed and emotional. And this is the, you know, the, the most violent person, arguably, uh, on the island. Uh, at this point, you see him, you know, reduced to tears just based on his internal emotions, not something somebody really says, um, but the stuff that he says and the people don't uh, replicate his feelings. And that's right, they are kids. You kind of forget that. You remember it every once in a while when the little ones come around again, you know, and they're just like, we having fun, playing around. And you're like, okay, that's right, they're little kids. Because you start to look towards Ralph and Piggy as a decision maker <coughs> as, you know, adults to some degree. Um, because they kind of are in relation to the little kids. They are adult-like. Um, and they are the ones in charge. And so we really see that break. Um, you know, we'll see the, you know, the, uh, you know, the huge pig fight, um, uh, pig chase that, that Jack and the others have in this chapter. And we see the, uh, the presence of the Lord of the Flies. We finally get to see uh, you know that and what uh, what the Lord of the Flies has to say to Simon. Uh, very very dark and very troubling. Um, you know, when we get to that point, um, at the very beginning of the chapter, uh, remember that the very the last couple pages had you know them streaking down the mountain. You know uh, after they confronted uh, Jack and Ralph uh, and and Roger, they confronted the the beast up there and it looked up at them. And so now they were scared. Okay, and that fear will definitely permeate and, and trickle down to, uh, to the people around them. Um, just in the first couple of sections there, you know, Vic, Piggy's voice came to them hushed. Are you sure? Really? Go up and see, said Jack contemptuously, and good riddance. The Ralph says, the beast had teeth and big black eyes. Well, we know who the beast really is, okay? We witnessed that plane crash. We witnessed that parachute and that thing being dragged up there. So when he's talking about big black eyes, what's he probably referring to? Do you have a vision of what that, that person looks like up there? He's a pilot, right? What do pilots wear on their heads? Masks, helmets, visors, okay? Now this is World War II era, and so it's probably nothing more than, you know, some sort of uh, leathery helmet with some big goggles, maybe sun visor type goggles. And remember, this person isn't nice and make up, you know. This person was dragged, you know, up, up, up the hill through rocks and trees and whatever until it rested at the top. Oh, and besides, it was unconscious and or dead when it parachuted out, so who knows what other injuries it has. And so you can't really blame them for not being able to recognize it as a human being sitting up there. Okay? As a human being that wasn't talking to them. If it was human, it probably talked. But instead it just sits there and sits up and looks right at them. And it's in the darkness. There wasn't a full moon. I think what it say, just a sliver of a moon, kind of like a fingernail of a moon. So there wasn't much light. And so this thing was up there that wasn't there before. And this thing moved when I stepped to it. Uh, there's something up there, and it's alive. I think we would all have that fear, okay? Um, and so this uh, this is permeating, and uh, you know Jack is whispering, um, uh, you know, after they ask uh, Ralph, what are we going to do? And he says, I don't know. Jack goes, well, What about my hunters? What about my hunters? Ralph goes, As long as there's light, we're brave enough. But then. And now that thing squats by the fire as though it didn't want us to be rescued. So we can't have a signal fire. We're beaten. So it's not just that we have to defeat this thing. It's that it's sitting next to our fire. We can't have a fire. And as Ralph has said many times, if we don't have fire, there is no chance of us to be rescued. We can't have smoke. 
So this is a big problem that they, excuse me, that they need to address. Um, here's a very important moment in this, in this section. So Jack comes back again. What about my hunters? Boys armed with sticks is the response. He's not making fun of the hunters, but realistically, what are they? Boys with sticks. And you're gonna go kill that thing that we don't know what it is that's sitting up there. You guys are boys that since you've killed one pig. One pig. So Ralph is being very realistic, but Jack takes this as a huge slight. Jack got to his feet, his, his face was red as he marched away. Piggy put on his one glass and looked at Ralph. Now you've done it. You've been rude about his hunters. Oh, shut up. Because Jack's only contribution to this society is through what? His leadership of the tribe? No, it's, that's right, it's hunting. And so Jack, his, his uh, power is being kind of questioned here. And Jack, uh, Ralph is just being completely just honest and realistic. He's not trying to embarrass. He's trying to say, you're just boys with sticks. What are we going to do against this big beast? If there were a tiger, we wouldn't go and hunt that tiger. You boys wouldn't go and hunt a tiger. So why would you go and hunt this beast? But Jack doesn't uh, care for that. Um, so Jack grabs a conch shell at the very bottom of 125 and blows it and says, I've called a meeting. First, you know now that we've seen the beast. We crawled up. We were only a few feet away. The beast sat up and looked at us. I don't know what it does. We don't even know what it is. Blah, 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 blah. But follow along on 126. Jack yells, quiet, you listen. The beast is sitting up there. Whatever it is, perhaps it's waiting. Hunting, yes, hunting. Jack says, hunting. And here's an interesting line that you might have just skimmed over. He remembered his age-old tremors in the forest. Remember the first time he went out hunting by himself? He came back when they were first talking about the beast, and he and he mentioned that you know if you're out in the woods, you know it, it, there was almost a feeling that he wasn't the hunter, that he was actually being hunted. And then we talked about it here about how if you've ever been out in the woods by yourself, you, you know even bright day or night, you just always kind of just have this unsure feeling to some degree. Um, and so he remembers this. He goes, yes. The beast is a hunter. Only, only, shut up, people. Shut up. The next thing is that we couldn't kill it. And the next is that Ralph said that my hunters are no good. Did Ralph say his hunters are no good? Uh, Ralph said that my hunters are no good. I never said that. Which he didn't say that. But Jack, with the emotions, Jack, Jack's like a politician here. He's going to make a power grab. He's going to throw a coup that tries to overthrow a government their government of Ralph, okay? And so just like in debates on television, somebody says something and the other opponent will grab onto what they say and twist it to make their argument stronger. And he does that here. I never said that. I've got the conch. I've got the conch, is what Jack says. Isn't that what people have said to Jack all along? But Jack utilizes that power and that conch shell when it suits his needs. And that's important for, him to under, for you to understand is that he disregards that power and that shell and he walked away from a meeting before, okay? But when he needs that power, he holds on to it and says, I've got the Kong shell, I've called this meeting. And that actually puts Ralph in his place a couple times because Ralph follows, follows the rules. Um, Ralph thinks you're cowards running away from the boar and the beast and that's not all. He's like Piggy. He says things like Piggy. He isn't a proper chief. He's a coward himself. On top, when Roger and me went on, he stayed back. Ralph says, I went too. After. So he's saying that Ralph isn't the leader to go across. How soon he forgets how uh, Ralph was the first one to walk across that bridge. Do you remember the first time he walked across the Castle Rock? And it was Jack who was too scared. This time on the mountain, Jack's the one who went up first. But then Ralph led them back, and Ralph is the one to stand up, and Ralph's the one who walked and stepped to the beast. Notice how that's not discussed? Because that's not going to help prove his point, Jack's point. And so Jack only talks about the stuff that helps Jack. Um, I went on too, then I ran away, is what Ralph said. Important, so did you. 
So don't play me off like a coward because I ran away from the beast. You ran away too, and Roger ran away. Jack turned to the hunters. He's not a hunter. He never got us meat. Well, there's only one time that there was ever any meat brought. So you gotta keep things in perspective, but yet remember, who is the audience? Children. Children covered in fear, dripping with fear, oozing with fear. Okay, so we have a very uh, volatile situation. Um, <laughs> Ralph at the bottom, all this talk, 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 talk. Who wanted it? Who called this meeting? Jack's response, very red in the face because the script has been flipped. All along, Jack was the one who always said there's too much talking, too much talking. But then Ralph's like, you were always talking about talking. Who called this meeting? Why are we even talking? You called it. And it gets him kind of back into his place and he gets red in face, which we see that happen quite a bit. So here's where the coup happens, 127. Who thinks Ralph oughtn't to be chief? Hands up. Whoever wants Ralph not to be chief. The silence continued, breathless and heavy and full of shame. You've seen this on movie and television, guy. There's that friction and somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm breaking away from her. Who wants to go with me? No one likes you, leader. They're all coming with me. Come on, everybody. And nobody shows up. So he has to walk away, you know, head down and leave. It happens in your TV shows, movies. It's happening here. But remember, we're, you know, we're reflected back, we're, we're reminded rather, that um, you know, this is a child. Uh, the red drained slowly from Jack's cheek, then came back with a painful rush. He licked his lips, turned his head at an angle so that his gaze avoided the embarrassment of linking with another's eyes. And he continues, how, how many think? And then he stops. He's too choked up to continue, to keep questioning and getting no response because it's more and more embarrassing. And this is where it really shows us that he's not a strong adult who can push through it. He's that child again. And uh, he says, all right then. He laid the conch with great care in the grass at his feet. The humiliating tears were running from the corner of his eyes. I'm not going to be a part of Ralph's lot. I'm going off by myself. He can catch his own pig. Anyone who wants to hunt when I can, come too. Or excuse me, anyone who wants, wants to hunt when I do, can come too. He leapt down from the platform and ran along the beach, paying no heed to the steady fall of his tears. And until he dived into the forest, Ralph watched him. And so it's like the show's over. The show took off. The train wreck ran away, dove into the forest, and all the way, all along, Ralph didn't say anything. They just watched him go. And then when he leaves, they come back to the situation of we need to handle this. And it's still early in the morning. Okay, it's still early in the morning. Piggy goes, we can do without Jack Meredith. Of course Piggy's going to say that. Piggy couldn't stand Jack. P uh, Jack made Piggy's life miserable. So these next few pages, as they run around and decide, uh, you know, Piggy really is a contributor. He's always been the intellectual, but he came up with more ideas. Simon steps up and uh, at the very bottom, and he says, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think we ought to climb the mountain. I think we need to climb the mountain. This is the first time he spoke since the last time at the meeting when he spoke and said, maybe the beast isn't, you know, from, you know, in the water, wherever. Maybe the beast is us. Maybe the fear is just us, is what Simon said then. So when he gets ready to speak here, Ralph says, what now, Simon? You got what other glorious gem do you have to bestow upon us? I think we need to go to the mountain, is what he says. He goes, oh, you know, are you crazy? Are you mad? Why would we go to the mountain? What else is there to do? Because remember, their fire needs to be up there. Their smoke signals, all of that stuff needs to be there. But that beast is sitting there. And so um, <coughs> Piggy comes up with the idea again of, well, why don't we have the fire down here? It'll be easier to tend. The only reason we had it up on the mountain in the first place was for the height. Now, our fire won't be able to be seen as far away because it's not on such a high peak. But if we get the smoke, at least it's something. Such a simple answer, simple solution. What a great idea. And so they run around and start grabbing and accumulating wood. Piggy, for the first time, takes his glasses off and starts to make a fire. He's contributing. 
You notice when you're not having a big bully there slamming on you all the time, verbally and physically, you allow people to spread their wings and start to contribute. Sam and Eric pull a log, a huge log, and they have this huge grin on their face because they're contributing. This is the first fire that the little ones have seen since that first fire on the mountain that went nuts and ended up, you know, killing that, uh, what we pretty much just assume, uh, the death of that uh, birthmark, mulberry colored kid. So they get all excited because they're experiencing this heat and fire and wow, it's like, okay, now we're camping or playing even though they're, you know, trying to be civilized. What's interesting as they're accumulating stuff um, is if you look on 130, 131, um, you know, they were talking about building that fire and Ralph goes, okay, that's too big of a fire. It's going to be too much work to keep that huge fire going. So Piggy says, well, we could experiment and see what the proper fire size is. Do you see these smart thoughts? We should experiment. We should. That's the intellectual that is Piggy. That's his contribution. Okay. And so then they notice uh, uh, on 131, uh, we'll make a new list of who's to look after the fire, is Ralph, Piggy, if you can find them. He looked around and for the first time he saw how few biggins there were and understood why the work had been so hard. Where's Maurice? I expect. No, he wouldn't go into the forest by himself, would he? But we've got to have a list. Well, where's Bill and Roger? I expect they've gone. I expect they won't play either. Piggy went on speaking. I seen them stealing off when we was gathering wood. They went that way. The same way he went himself. And he would obviously be Jack. Right. Okay. So these biggins who wouldn't raise their hand to knock down Ralph as a leader, they didn't want to draw his ire, his wrath. Maybe they were too embarrassed. Maybe it took this hard work to realize, yeah, we're not going to do this. And so they slowly slink away. It's like if you had this big mob group and you're listening to a leader in the middle, the biggins would slowly get to the outside of that circle while the meeting's still going, and then one after the other would just kind of leave and go and try to uh, hook up with Jack later. So Ralph and Piggy, Simon, and pretty much the little ones, really the first people who showed up when the, the conch shell was blown the very first time. Okay, Jack and all his hunters have gone. Now, Simon was one of Jack's uh, crew when he first showed up. And so we see him kind of choosing sides and defying, not necessarily to be a jerk, but just defying and, and st staying with the true leader and not going with uh, his choir boy tribe. Um, at the very bottom of 132, follow along, please. It's an important part. Um, he says... Uh, We'll, we'll do all right on our own. It's them that haven't, that haven't no common sense that make trouble on the sound. It's them. It's those people that have no common sense. Those are the ones who always cause trouble, and those are the ones that will cause trouble on the sound. It's a very uh, prophetic, you know, foreshadowing, uh, you know, looking into the future type statement that is right there. That the trouble isn't caused by the little ones. It isn't caused by, you know, us, the intellect, the smart ones. It's caused by the people who have no common sense. Let's go play. And we've spent lunch. We've killed one pig. But really, that should be our main focus. And we should spend all our time hunting pig. Brilliant use of your time. But that's the whole mentality of Jack. And those that follow Jack, which is a big contributor to the tribe, all those big, big, strong people. Um, notice Ralph says, where's Simon? I don't know. He might be. They think that maybe he went climbing the mountain. Piggy, he might be. He's cracked. He's nutty. He's fruity. He's weird. Okay, he might have gone off and, and climbed that mountain. That's stupid suicide, man. But he might have because that's what he wanted. So we find out instantly because Simon could have gone away with Jack as well. We don't know where he's at, but they don't think he went with Jack. They think, well, the last thing he talked about was going to the mountain. Maybe he went to the mountain. We see in this next paragraph, he didn't go to the mountain. Where did he escape to? His little hideout. His quiet little place. And if you look at the last line of that little paragraph, it says he was thirsty. And then he became very thirsty because it was hot, you know, in there. And he continued to sit. He was just sitting there. 
for some reason, some comfort level, he just decided, I'm going to my place, because there was a lot of, you know, volatile energy, a lot of fighting and yelling, and, and the place is divided. And so you can just imagine, I've got to get out of here. And so he goes to his little burrow, his little covert hiding place, and just sits. That's very important that you know where he's at, because what he's going to experience here in a little bit, okay, you might forget that he's actually there to experience. And that's when we have Jack and his crew uh, make another kill. Transported with, uh, to Jack's group, to his tribe, um, you know, he says to them, hunting, okay, will hunt, I'm going to be chief. They nodded and the crisis passed easily. The crisis of not having a chief and figuring out who's going to be chief. There is no democracy here. There is no, how many of you want Jack? Anybody else want to go up against Jack? Anybody? Anybody? There was none of that. It's, I'm chief. It's obvious. You've come to me. You want me to hunt and be in charge. And so we see that he is definitely going to be in charge, not that we were really concerned about it. Um, look at what he says. He says, we're going to forget the beast. That's right. Yes, yeah, forget the beast. We're going to just forget about it. Because if you just ignore something, it goes away, right? Isn't that what happens in life? You have this big traumatic experience. Just forget it. Ignore it. It'll be fine. It'll go away. Okay, you got a nagging pain in your arm when you get older. Ah, it'll go away. It'll go away. Then, well, yeah, when you die of a stroke, it'll go away. Okay? So he says, we're just going to forget about it. We're going to forget about it, and it'll just go away. We don't have to worry about it. But we see in a couple pages that he didn't forget about it. In fact, after the killing of the pig, they decided to, uh, he says, we're going to leave a gift for the beast. Find a stick with two sharp ends. Well, you never need a stick or spear with two sharp ends, except when you want to stab it into the ground and it holds, and then it's pointy so we can put something on top. And so they put the kill head there. You've seen in movies, you know, we're going to sacrifice something for whether it's gods or for some other person or, or whatever, some tribal custom. Uh, here they say, okay, whenever we do a kill, we'll leave something for the beast. Because if the beast is happy, the beast won't come after us. How's Jack doing with forgetting about the beast? That's probably not going to play out too well, okay, forgetting about it. Uh, but that's what he wants to do here. Um, at the bottom of 134 to 135, they, they found uh, an enclosure where some pigs were, and they have this big chase. Um, on 135, he said, uh, Here, struck down by the heat, the sow fell, and the hunters hurled themselves at her. This dreadful eruption from an unknown world made her frantic. She's not used to being you know, assaulted. Who are these people? This is my aunt. You know, that type of thing. So this people from another world, they just completely confused it. She squealed and bucked, and the air was full of sweat and noise and blood and tear. Roger ran round the heap, prodding with his spear whenever pig flesh appeared. Jack was on top of the sow, stabbing downward with his knife. Roger found a lodgment for his point and began to push till he was leaning with his whole weight. The spear moved forward inch by inch, and the terrified squealing became a high-pitched scream. So imagine what this looks like. It's this swarm. And everybody just jumps and swarms on it. You've seen zombie movies and TV shows. Well, once a live person falls down to a zombie, what do the others do? It's a feeding frenzy, right? You just go to town. And so they say Jack's on top of it, just stabbing with its knife. Roger's running around this sow, and wherever he can see pig flesh, he's stabbing. And then it talks about he found a lodgment where he put it. And we find out in a little bit, because people pull back and laugh, he stuck it in the butt of the pig. And he just leaned, and I mean, envision this kid just leaning his entire weight into that stick. And it said that the stick went and moved inch by inch. I mean, they're skewering that pig. You see pigs put on spits, right? You know, and, and roasted and stuff. I mean, that's, he's kind of doing that while the pig is alive. Can you imagine the pain that's being caught? I mean, it's not a mercy killing. 
I mean, they're running around stabbing it. Jack's up there, stab, stab, stab with his knife. Everybody else is sitting there stabbing it from the side. And then Roger just kind of stabs it through its insides. Remember, Roger is that one who, who has that darkness about him. Do you remember? Because I mentioned it specifically for moments like this and some other stuff that's going to happen. But he just has this darkness, that this foreboding, this not very friendly, this could he be a serial killer in, a, in the real world? Not that he could be, but you know, there's just something off about him. Okay, and we see that uh, play out here um, that he, you know, skewers them. These are all kids, and look at what they just did to this to this animal. You hear about serial killers in our real world that they start with abusing animals and killing and mutilating animals, and then it kind of leads up and up and up. And you just see the the bloodlust these people had to kill this, and then that dark thought of Roger to insert that and push and push. And uh, it's very uh, brutal, um, very brutal indeed. And so at the very bottom of 136, when Jack says, sharpen a stick at both ends, a very important line, because he's going to repeat it later in the book. And just the phrase, sharpen a stick with two ends, because you know it's got a stick in the ground, and then something's going to get put on it. That's important, OK? Um, so keep that in mind. One ram one end in the earth. Jack held up his, the head and jammed the soft throat down on the pointed end of the stick, which pierced through into the mouth. He stood back and the head hung there. A little blood dribbled down the stick. This head is for the beast. It's a gift. Okay. Now we find out, after you know that little break there on 137, this is in the clearing just on the outside of Simon's viewing place. Okay? His viewing place. And so he was just witness to this mass killing and such. And he's witness to that head on a stick, and uh, which with the book deems the Lord of the Flies later. Um, page 138, when they announce that it is the Lord of the Flies. He has now moved out and he's looking at it. He's looking at the half-closed eyes of the pig. He's staring into those eyes. He's staring into the mouth. These flies are starting to congregate around the, the blood and the decay so that they can start to eat. The pile of guts was a black blob of flies that buzzed like a saw. After a while, these flies found Simon. Gorged, they alighted by his runnels of sweat and drank. They tickled under his nostrils and played leapfrog on his thighs. They were black and iridescent green and without number, meaning there were just too many. And in front of Simon, the Lord of the Flies hung on his stick and grinned. At last, Simon gave up and looked back, saw the white teeth and dim eyes, the blood, and his gaze was held by that ancient, inescapable recognition. In Simon's right temple, a pulse began to beat on the brain. This is a very intense moment for him. There's no talking going on at this moment. He's just staring into that mouth, focusing. And then he kind of has an, an attack of some sort where his head starts to throb, starts to throb. Um, this is almost like a movie in how we jump from scene to scene. While Simon's dealing with this, we are transported back to the beach where uh, you know Ralph and uh, Piggy and the little ones are talking, and they have fire and everything's going well. Until on 140, uh, Jack comes in because they need to steal fire so they can cook, and they need fire to you know stay warm and have all that stuff. But remember, Piggy's glasses are what makes a fire. And so they rush in. The forest near them burst into uproar. Demonic figures with faces of white and red and green rushed out howling so that the little ones fled screaming. Out of the corner of his eye, Ralph saw Piggy running. Two figures rushed at the fire, and he prepared to defend himself, but they grabbed half-burnt branches. So they just went and grabbed something that was already on fire so they could run to their fire and start it, or their kindling, and go from there so that they can cook the, the stuff. Um, Jack makes an announcement. Listen, all of you, me and my hunters, we're living along the beach by a flat rock. We hunt and feast and have fun. 
If you want to join my tribe, come and see us. Perhaps I'll let you join, perhaps not. So controlling the power, not just, hey, come party, You're, everybody's accepted. Because what if Piggy walks up? You think they're going to accept him? Probably not. And so he has that power and that control, um, which is important to him and always has. Tonight we're having a feast. We've killed a pig and we've got meat. You can come and eat with us if you like. And look at what he says. He nods to savages, murmured. Jack spoke sharply. Go on, go on. The two savages looked at each other, raised their spears together, and spoke. The chief has spoken. Doesn't that just seem kind of silly? Doesn't it? Dealing with what they have on this island. But look at Jack. No common sense. Just wanting to play, have fun, and be in control. And he wants power. Remember, at the very beginning, he wanted rules. He said, we need to have rules so that when people break rules, what can we do to them? Do you remember the word starts with a P? Punish. He wanted that. And so now that he's in control, imagine what rules are being created for him, or by him, rather. Um, good. Page 143, I want to focus on this. I want to focus on uh, the Lord of the Flies conversation with Simon. Okay? Simon is the only one on this island who's not scared. He's the only one that's telling people that maybe the fear is just us. Now, he didn't see the beast. He said, we should go up to the mountain, guys. I think we need to go. And so ultimately, he's going to head to the mountain alone. But he says, you are a silly little boy, said the Lord of the Flies. You're an ignorant, silly little boy. Don't you agree, said the Lord of the Flies? Aren't you just a silly boy? Simon answered him in the same silent voice, so he didn't respond, he just stared. And have you ever stared at something and you just focused and zoomed in in your mind and you just got lost in thought? So he has this rhythmic sounding of the uh, chainsaw, you know, not chainsaw, but the, 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 the flies buzzing around. And eventually they're buzzing within the mouth and there's echoing coming out. And he's just focused on that mouth. And then if you're envisioning that that mouth is talking, Okay, and this thing is definitely representing evil. Well then, said the Lord of the Flies, you better run off and play with the others. They think you're baddie. You don't want Ralph to think you're baddie, do you? You like Ralph a lot, don't you? And Piggy and Jack? Simon's head was tilted slightly up. His eyes could not break away from the Lord of the Flies hung in space before him. What are you doing out here all alone? Aren't you afraid of me? Simon shook. There isn't anyone to help you, only me, and I'm the beast. Simon's mouth labored, brought forth audible words. Pig's head on a stick. It's like he's reaffirming that this is just a pig's head on a stick. It's a pig's head on a stick. It's a pig's head. But his mind is having this conversation with this evil, this symbolic thing that's pretty much you know, evil and, and Satan incarnate to some degree. Um, fancy thinking the beast was something you could hunt and kill, said the head. For a moment or two, the forest and all and the other dimly appreciated places echoed with a parody of laughter. So imagine there's echoes of laughter. Imagine you thought the beast was something that you could kill. <laughs> you know, all the way around. And he's just sitting there. One against many, in essence. Um, you knew, didn't you? I'm part of you. Close, close, close. I'm the reason why it's no go. I'm the reason why things are what they are. The laughter shivered again. Come now, said the Lord of the Flies. Get back to the others and we'll forget the whole thing. Simon's head wobbled. His eyes were half closed as though he were imitating the obscene thing on the stick. He knew that one of his times was coming on. Okay, There was a moment, the very first time we saw him, and we maybe didn't mention this, where he fainted. Okay, Where he had kind of passed out, whether it was the heat, remember they had those big choir robes on when they first showed up, or what, but he fainted. And so he feels like he has a, a fit coming on again. Um... He knew that one of his times was coming on. The Lord of the Flies was expanding like blue. So as he stared at it, 
it was getting bigger and bigger. All of his stuff, his head's throbbing. This stuff is happening in his mind. We are not seeing the head actually expanding. And that's why he kept saying, pig on a stick, pig on a stick. But he's losing his control to differentiate between that pig on a stick and this evil, evil thing. Talk to him. This is ridiculous. You know perfectly well you're only meet me down there. So don't try to escape. Meet me down there. Where? Well, if he's representing Satan or the devil, you know you're going to meet me in hell. Okay? This is ridiculous. You know perfectly well you only meet me down there, so don't try to escape. Simon's body was arched and stiff. The arch, excuse me. Uh, the Lord of Flies spoke in the voice of a schoolmaster. This has gone quite far enough, my poor misguided child. Do you think you know better than I do? I'm warning you. I'm going to get angry, do you see? You're not wanted, understand? You are going to have fun on this island, understand? We are going to have fun on this island. So don't try it on, my poor misguided boy, or else. Simon found he was looking into a vast mouth. There was blackness within, a blackness that spread. Or else, said the Lord of the Fly, we shall do you. See, Jack and Roger and Maurice and Robert and Bill and Piggy and Ralph, do you? See? Simon was inside the mouth. He fell down and lost consciousness. Simon had that fainting moment where he was overwhelmed. And this thing says, you will act like the children. You will go and play and get wrapped up, okay? Where you forget about trying to escape this island and get away. That you are here, you are stuck, and you are, you know, de-evolving with the rest of them. You do that or I'm going to get angry. And when I get angry, I'm going to have them kill you. And you saw what they did to the pig. And so it's almost like this pig is a, um, even though this is all Simon just envisioning this, okay, while he's envisioning this, you know, it's not truly, I'm a pig on it, you know, talk, 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 like a Muppet. That's not happening at all. And then there's just too much darkness and blackness. And then as he's staring at the pig, the blackness overtakes him and, and he faints. So Simon has, you know, in his mind, whether it's real or, or just symbolic, he just experienced this connection to evil, this understanding of what this island represents or what this, this falling apart of the society, what's going to happen. And it's very, very uh, traumatic for these individuals. Um, and especially for him, we see him fall apart. Okay, um, A very key moment, and I love that scene. It's so short. But you see Simon, who is always the, the good guy, the positive, upbeat. Don't worry, Ralph. You'll be you, you'll get you know saved. You'll oh, I know. I just have a feeling. Helping little ones here and there. And now he's approached, which you need to stop doing what you're doing. And embrace the darkness. Embrace the dark side to some degree. Go and have fun, and we'll forget this ever happened. You keep it up, I will kill you. You keep this up, you will die. I will have those other people kill you. So a very, very threatening manner, um, and Simon <coughs> understands this. So a very uh, interesting scene that can be just discussed and analyzed, and you know, figuring out what truly uh, happened and transpired. <coughs>